everyone, and welcome to our Money Matters event for today. We are so happy that you have joined us, and we are excited to be talking to you about our featured topic for today, which is understanding those credit reports. So while we give it a few more minutes for folks to log in and join this event, I'm gonna go over some housekeeping tips just so that we know how the event is gonna operate. Uh, so first and foremost, please know that you have the ability to rename your Zoom profile. Just go hover your mouse over your webcam profile or your name, and you should see three dots appear. And then um, when those three dots appear, what you can do is rename your Zoom profile. We ask that you please include your first and last name so that we can get to know you, but then also it helps us with tracking attendance. Also, if there are pronouns that you would like for us to use, please include those as well in your Zoom profile. Also, please know that this event is being recorded so that we can share it for continued learning on our social media and YouTube accounts. Um, if you do not wish to be part of that recording, just keep that webcam off and you are still welcome and able to participate by asking questions through chat. Along those lines, we will ask that all microphones remain muted during the event. We get it. Things happen that are beyond your control. All of a sudden, the dog starts barking at something in the background or somebody in your house starts using that really loud ice machine. So in order to make sure that everyone can uh, hear the presenter, uh, that's why we will keep all microphones muted. Also, please know that captions are available to you. So if that would help you out with learning and being able to participate today, just go back down to that Zoom profile and click the option to show subtitles, and then those will be available throughout today's event. We want this to be a place where you can get those questions answered. So if anything pops into your mind, just drop them in the chat box in Zoom and we will save time at the end to answer and address all of those questions towards the end of the event. We want this to be not only a fun space and a place where you can learn, but also a safe space. So please make sure that you keep all conversation and questions respectful, clean and civil. And then last but not least, please know that you will be eligible to receive your certificate of completion from 1AZ Credit Union, which is great to document that you attended this event for extra credit with your instructors, or even to add to that co-curricular transcript, documenting all of the extra things you're doing to build your leadership skills at Pima. In order to receive that certificate completion, we need you to complete the feedback survey, which is listed on the screen. And we will share that again at the end of the presentation and also link it into the chat box. So this is just a reminder, in order to get that certificate completion, complete the feedback survey. But more details on that later. But for right now, I want to go ahead and introduce you to the team who helped coordinate and plan today's event. Uh, uh, I am Renee Forsyth, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I lead the First Year Experience Program for Pima Community College. Uh, the First Year Experience Program is an umbrella program that offers seven different initiatives to get students connected with Pima. One of those initiatives is what we call our adulting series to help you become responsible and thriving adults. And so as part of that adulting 101 series, we offer this Money Matters program in partnership with Pima's Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships. So Carla Gonzalez and Juanita Bonillas help us plan and coordinate this event. They weren't able to join us today, but they say hello. And if you have any additional questions for that office, we will share their contact information at the end. But this event would not be possible without our community partner, 1AZ Credit Union, who um, put together the uh, curriculum for today and will be presenting momentarily. But first, I would love for you to introduce yourself, Jason. Absolutely. Thanks, Renee. So as Renee mentioned, my name is Jason Carrick, and I'm the uh, workplace banking coordinator. I work a lot with colleges and universities with, with 1AZ Credit Union. And to give you a little bit about my background, my, my career is span in banking has spanned about 22 years or so. I've held various roles, but uh, towards the front end of my career, I did some uh, underwriting on, on the uh, uh, 
when people are applying for loans and credit cards and things like that. So it gave me some great insight and experience with, with credit. And uh, I hope, I hope throughout the course of this uh, presentation that I can share some of that insight with you. And hopefully there's a, you'll have a few takeaways at the end of it. Yes. And I noticed in chats that there is a question about um, how the recording will be shared. Uh, give me one moment here. Student engagement. I'm terrible at typing and talking at the same time. Um, so yes, after today's event, we will send an email out to all of our participants saying thank you. In that email, we will share once more the feedback survey link in case you weren't able to complete it during the event. But then also once the recording is finalized, we will share that through email as well. Or you can always keep an eye on our YouTube page, which is where that recording will be posted. Um, the YouTube page is is Pima Students Engagement, and it will be housed under the Adult Teen 101 playlist. All right, so to get things started, we want to uh, share with you a video to kind of get you thinking a little bit more about uh, credit reports and how to understand them. So let me get my share settings updated here so that we can hear and see the video well. And here we go. If a friend asked to borrow $100 from you, would you do it? You're probably thinking, that depends on the friend. Are they trustworthy? Have they borrowed money from me before? And if so, did they pay it back? Borrowing money is as old as civilization itself, and for a long time, it was based on personal relationships and recommendations. The only way for a lender to know whether they could trust someone to pay them back was by knowing them personally, or if someone else they already trusted vouched for them. But when credit became big business, lending companies needed a more efficient way to decide which borrowers they could trust. So in 1956, a data analytics firm called Fair, Isaac and Company started creating mathematical models that used a borrower's history to measure their risk. And in 1989, they debuted the first industry standard algorithm, the FICO score. This formula was soon adopted by the big three credit reporting bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Your FICO score is a three-digit number between 300 and 850 that indicates to a lender how safe it is to lend money to you. A high score tells a lender you'll probably pay the money back on time, so they're more likely to give you a loan with good terms. A low score signifies that you might not be able to pay the money back, so if they're willing to offer you credit at all, they'll want to be compensated for the risk by charging more interest. But it's important to remember, this number doesn't represent who you are as a person, or even whether you are financially responsible. There are people with high credit scores who live paycheck to paycheck, and people with low credit scores who save like little chips. Your credit score only reflects your past relationship to debt. Every time you borrow or repay money, like taking out a credit card or making a student loan payment, the lender reports that activity to the credit bureau, where it goes into the math machine. But not all data is judged equally. The largest percent of your FICO all right, so actually, I'm going to now hand the reins over to Jason, and that's a great segue for him to continue talking to us a little bit more about how to understand those credit reports. So Jason, take it away. All right, give me one moment here. You guys can all see my screen and let me just get my PowerPoint. Here we go. Everything good? Okay. Great. All right, perfect. So as we mentioned, I'm gonna be covering uh, what's called understanding your credit uh, report and score today. And to make this a little bit more interactive, what I would encourage you to do is, is throughout my presentation, as something comes up, as a question comes to your mind, chat it in. And then at the very end of my presentation, uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and address, or I'm gonna go ahead and address those questions uh, one by one. So feel free to, again, as, as things come up in your mind, just, just feel free to chat them in. That way they're logged and you'll remember them. Okay. All right, so the, the content that I'm going to be presenting to you is we partner with uh, Green Path Services, which is a nonprofit out there, and they put together some great financial literacy type content that, uh, again, I'm happy to share with you today. So uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the things we're going to be talking about are why is credit important, uh, some of the things that you'll find on your credit report, 
how you can go about obtaining a copy of your credit report, credit scores and, and how they're calculated. And in many of your cases, maybe how to build credit. In some people's cases, uh, how to rebuild credit and common myths about credit as well. So let's talk a little bit about why credit is important. So, you know, many of us uh, do know this, some of you may not, but, but you know, as you go for that, that your first job or maybe even your dream job, many companies uh, will check credit score. As a matter of fact, I saw a statistic recently that said about 60% of employers do, do credit checks when they're uh, doing screening for candidates that they're, they're considering hiring for, for employment. The obvious one would be kind of getting a loan when you need it, whether that be, you know, you're getting your first credit card or uh, your first car loan or auto loan for yourself. And, and eventually down the road, when you're, when you're going to apply for, for a mortgage to get your first home. Also renting or buying, which I think when, when we all think of that, when we, we buy a place or we get a mortgage, you would, you would need to have good credit. Your credit would be, would be checked. But um, some people don't think about the fact that, you know, they, they may be renting or uh, many apartments, many landlords will, will do credit checks and, and check your, your credit and references to ensure that uh, really that, that, you know, you're, you're going to be worth the risk and that if they've got multiple candidates that they want to pick the one who they think is the most likely to pay on time and, and to uh, pay as agreed. So this example just kind of illustrates the, the difference in, in credit score variance and, and what that can mean to you in terms of uh, uh, interest rate and, and even uh, overall dollars over the life of the loan. So in our example here to the left, we've got Diego, who's got a, a credit score of 660. Uh, he's qualified for his mortgage of an interest rate at 5.25%, and that would make his monthly payment $1,381. So over the course of that 30-year loan that he has with the bank, he's, he's paying uh, $496,984. So if you compare that to Angela, whose credit score is excellent, 750, I mean, I would say it really anything above 720 is very, very good. 750 certainly is, is excellent. But uh, as you can see, her interest rate was was lower um, versus Diego's, which is 5.25. Angela's is 4.63. That makes her uh, the, the monthly payment $1,285, almost $100 less expensive than, than what Diego is paying. And if you if you were to quantify that over the life of the of the 30 year loan, uh, paid 462,726. So over at roughly $34,000 less in total interest than what Diego is. So that, that just goes to show you how uh, really uh, building credit and maintaining an excellent score, how that can, can impact you in, in future uh, you know, momentous occasions in your life. And again, the total savings for Angela, $34,258. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about what, what's on your credit report or what, or what you can find on your credit report. So there's three credit reporting agencies out there. There's Experian, TransUnion, and, and Equifax. And um, some of it can be, some, depending on where you live in the country, sometimes it can be a little bit more regional. Um, sometimes if you're applying for a mortgage, they might take your mid score of the, of the three credit reporting agencies. And then there's some other institutions like us, for example, where we use, you know, TransUnion. So you, you're never really sure which which of the credit reporting agencies or the scores might be used. So it's important to kind of to, to stay on top of them and, and, and to manage and monitor them to see what your score is and, and constantly doing a, a check to make sure that there's nothing on your credit file that's maybe dragging down your score that shouldn't be on there. And we'll talk a little bit about the dispute process here in a, in a slide down the road. So what's on your credit reports? So you can find identifying information. So it'll, it'll give your name, your address, your social security number, not just your current address, but any previous addresses that you, that you maybe have lived at. So it, it's got uh, identifying information to, to you as the individual. Open accounts. So any open accounts that you've, have, you've had currently and, and in the history of any accounts that you've, that you've ever had, whether that be good, good history or bad history. Closed account. So once you've closed out an account, that's not the end of it. I mean, you'll be able to see on your on your credit report um, that that you you held that and the dates that it were open and the date that it was closed. Collection records. So if uh, 
you know, if you ever have anything, medical bills tend to be a common one where somebody, maybe somebody didn't even realize they had a medical bill and it went to collections. And so again, if you're checking your credit report at least once or twice a year, you're gonna be able to see that. And if something kind of slipped by you or, or something that you weren't aware of, you can you can handle it and or dispute it if it's not something, if you feel strongly that it's not something that uh, should be showing up on there. Inquiry, so th this would be any time that you're applying for, for credit card, you know, credit, any type of credit. So if you apply for your first credit card or not alone, you're going to see the name of the bank, the date uh, that you applied for something. And, and uh, you, you'd want to be careful to, to not get excessive inquiries in a short period of time. Sometimes that could be, show up as a red flag to, to a lender if you've got you know 10 inquiries for credit in a short period of time. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Consumer statement. So this is something that I've seen customers or our members take advantage of where maybe they've had fraud occur against them or, or maybe their identity was stolen and they had some issues with, uh, you know, trying to get these things cleared up and off their credit report. So in some cases, somebody, people will reach out to the credit reporting agencies and say they'd like to put a consumer statement on their credit file. It's something along the lines like, you know, I, Jason Carrick would like to be contacted anytime that uh, there, there's an application for credit in my name. I could be reached at, and then I, Put the phone number on there so that way if somebody ever does get your information and apply for something in your name unbeknownst to you um the the lender would call that number that you put on file um, and then that would make you aware of course that uh you know, that's that's occurring and you'd catch it before it even gets too far down the road so it's something to, to keep in mind we'll talk next about how do you go about obtaining a copy of your credit report so there's a there's a free resource out there called annualcreditreport.com and you can see the the address and the phone number and uh, uh, again it is free now it's it's limited in the sense that it's not going to give you your score but uh, it's gonna you're gonna be able to see any any trade information that are on there trade would be maybe a you know if you've got a credit card if you've got you've got a mortgage or an auto loan on file and who the bank is with and when that that particular loan was open, the payment history, that's called a trade line on a credit report. So it allows you to go through and check all of your, your trade lines to make sure that everything is as it should be. And, uh, uh, but the score though, you, you would, uh, you, you can actually get your score if you pay for it for each of the three bureaus. And I want to say it's like between six to $8 to pay for your, uh, your credit score. And again, doing that once a year or so is, is uh, not a bad idea, especially if you anticipate kind of a major life event or, you know, you're saving for six months for a vehicle and you might, you know, you're going to need a, maybe an auto loan to go along with that. So you want to you know, stay on top of what, what is my score? Is it as high as it can be at the time that I want to, I know that I'm going to be applying for credit. So this is this I just kind of referenced this that uh, obtaining credit scores will cost someone in the neighborhood of, of six to eight dollars per credit bureau to get those uh, scores. All right, we're, this is going to talk a little bit about information and, and, and how long it may stay on your credit report. So inquiries and, and again to, to clarify. Uh, an inquiry is is when you apply for any type of credit. That inquiry will can stay on your credit file or credit report for up to two years. So some of these that we're showing are kind of derog it's derogatory information. So if you had late payments, if you had uh, collection accounts, uh, foreclosures, Chapter 13 bankruptcy, all of that adverse information could stay on your credit report for up to seven years. And then the last time frame of 10 years, so a certain type of bankruptcy, so chapter seven bankruptcy could, could last up to, uh, on your credit report for up to 10 years. All right, the good news is, is that positive uh, credit activity stays on your credit report indefinitely. So an example that would be, you know, when you make on-time payments for your credit cards and or mortgages, you'll see that positive, payment history stay on there for, for forever. All right, this, this shows that, uh, you know, if you're gonna be trying to uh, dispute information that was on there, you'd wanna keep copies or keep records to document the claim. Um, you're, you have the ability to file a dispute online through the phone or, or by mail and, and going directly to the three credit reports, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian would probably be the best way to do it. Online would be, I've, I've tried calling before by phone and you could, there can be quite uh, 
quite lengthy hold time. So my suggestion would be trying to, to do disputes online if you ever needed to do one. And let's just say you filed a dispute and you, at the end of their investiga investigation, they, they determined that uh, you know, the dispute didn't go in your favor and then it stayed on there, but you feel adamant about the fact that, no, I, I did not apply for this. This is something that this, this uh, medical collection should not be on there. I took care of that, whatever the case may be. Uh, if, you're, if you're confident in that, then you can always file a complaint with the, uh, we call it the CFPB or this Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I, I list the phone number there. Next, we're going to, to, to dive into uh, your credit score and, and how credit scores are calculated. So this kind of shows you the, uh, the, the range uh, in, the, in the dark green, the 800 or more score, that represents excellence. Like I said, I, I personally think that, you know, from a, most banks or credit union standpoints, anything above 720 typically will, will qualify for you for the best interest rates. And... Uh, Credit scores can go as low as 300, I believe. The credit score, it's a, so it's a three-digit number. And to the lender, it reflects the, your, your credit risk and the likelihood, the overall likelihood that you'll repay your, your loan on time and as agreed. As the little video that we showed at the beginning states, FICO, so Fair Isaac Company, is one of the most widely used scoring models. And on that, that wheel there, that, or the continuum, I guess you could say, the, the top scores in the, in the 800s, that represents the lowest amount of risk to lenders, and all the way down to the area where you'll find in red, that, that would pose a higher risk, or, or you know, they'd, they'd think long and hard about before they'd lend, lend money to somebody with a score in that range. So the factors that can impact a credit score, we'll talk about that here. This gives you a breakdown of, of, if you think about it in terms of a pie graph and, and, and uh, the factors that affect your credit score. So the thing that, that the highest weighting or the thing that affects your credit score the most would be payment history. So that would mean anytime you have anything that's going to be reporting to uh, a credit report, such a credit card, or any type of loan, a mortgage, anything along those lines, uh, every time you make your payment each month on time, it's going to show as is paid on time on your credit report. That history and data represents 35% of the makeup of your overall three-digit score. The next uh, highest weighting, I guess you could say, would be the, um, I call it, I, I, sometimes I'll refer to it as percent utilization. So think of it in terms of the total amount owed that you have versus the av amount of available credit, especially on the revolving credit standpoints. And just to kind of uh, define what that means, uh, there's different types of, of credit, and, and I'll touch on that a little bit more later, but um, a credit card, which is something where, you know, may maybe you're given a $10,000 limit on a credit card. If you don't use it at all, then you're not carrying a balance and your percent of what you owe versus what's available is 0%. Um, and, and so that, that would be kind of representing what revolving credit is. Whereas an installment loan, which might, an auto loan is a good example. Um, you might be applying for a car that's $20,000 and you get an auto loan from a bank or a credit union. Well, that $20,000 loan that you've applied for is all of that 20,000 is advanced to you. And typically it's paid back over a term. Let's just say the term is 48 months or, or four years. So all that money is advanced to you, and then you that you can't reaccess that line of credit. It's 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 advanced up front, and you're paying uh, a payment that's amortized over the over the length of of the loan. So that's that just a simple breakdown of what the difference is between revolving and, and installment uh, credit. And and another simple math example would be: let's just say you've got you know three credit cards, and if you add up the credit limit of all three of those, it's ten thousand dollars, and you, you have a balance between the three of those cards that are $5,000. So your percentage utilization would be 50% of your available credit you're using. And that's where you can see that, that breakdown is of that 30% of your score comes from that. The general rule of thumb is, is that you want to keep your percent utilization, or again, your amounts owed versus what you have available to you at 30% or less. 
if, if you didn't carry any any balances on there and you, you like you used your credit cards and paid them off and down down to zero that would be ideal and and uh that would be reflected in your score typically more favorably but uh if you did need to revolve a balance at any given time let's just say you know you had car repairs that were an emergency that came up and you needed to use your card for that um that, that that's something where you'd want to try to keep your your balances less than 30 percent of what you owe total so the next category over would be the length of your credit history. So people are eligible for credit at the age of, of 18. And uh, again, once you get your first piece of credit, it'll, it'll show up the, the time and, and or I'm sorry, the date and the name of the lender will be on there. And so the, the length of time or the period of time that you've, you've had certain pieces of credit open, I mean, that can affect your score. That, that can be represent 15% of your overall credit score. Next over, we've got uh, the types of credit used or the credit mix. So I touched on this just a, just a, a minute or so ago about the uh, different types of credit. So I mentioned revolving credit, which would be credit cards or even a home equity line of credit, different from a home equity loan. Um, a mortgage would be more of an installment type of loan over a certain period of time. The same thing with an auto loan. Um, it's, it's Again, that's classified as an installment loan. So that's what we mean when we talk about the, the different types of credit use or the credit mix. So that overall picture makes up 10% of your, your credit score. And then last would be new credit. Any new credit would, would affect your score with a weighting of about 10%. Back to what I mentioned earlier, that, that what a red flag may be. Let's just say that you're somebody who's, um, you've handled your credit well for a, for a long period of time, you've got a great credit score. And then all of a sudden, in a short period of time, let's say a six month period of time, you've applied for, you know, five or six new credit cards. Well, that would be out of the ordinary or out of the norm. And, and it might represent to, to a lending institution or a bank that, that hmm, something's going on here, that maybe this person lost a job. Maybe there's a reason why they're leaning more heavily on, on credit. And uh, so anyway, newer credit or, or uh, quite a bit of new credit in a short period of time can, can affect your score negatively. So I'm gonna, I've already explained these. I'm gonna run through them real quick. Another uh, free resource that's out there for you, it's called creditkarma.com or Credit Karma. And it'll provide a variety of scores with information from TransUnion and, and Equifax. Uh, credit score can be updated weekly, tracking credit scores. Um, I mentioned this earlier too, that if you know that, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to save up in a year from now, I wanna buy my first home or um, I, I wanna buy a used car six months from now. And you anticipate that, that big expense. It gives you an opportunity to identify what your credit score is and then kind of track and monitor it to make sure that it's in, in its best position or you're in your best positioning yourself for to have a high score at the time that you're applying for that. Because think back to the one of the first examples I showed you and, and, and what that could mean to you in terms of a the savings on a lower payment and lower interest rate because your score maybe is 30 points higher because you've managed it well than you know what it would have been had you not. All right, so this example is, is gonna say, you know, who has the better, the better credit score? So we've got Diego that uh, has a balance of $800 on a, on a limit of 1,000, and he pays his entire balance every month. Angela has a balance of $5,000. Her overall credit limit's $10,000, and she pays her minimum payment every month. So think in your mind who you think might have the better credit score, and we'll show you here, show you the answer. So Angela would have the better score and it, it might sound a little counterintuitive because Diego, Diego's paying off his entire balance every month. But the reason being would be that if you take a look at the percentage of overall available credit that Diego has when he shows a balance reporting on his credit file, that, that's 80% of, of his availability, whereas Angela is at 50% of her availability. So um, her score would be impacted uh, more more positively because of that that percentage. However, the the, the fact that uh, you know Diego is uh, Diego is paying an offer month now. Obviously, he's got the money to do that every month, so he may want to reconsider that and maybe pay cash for that whatever those eight hundred dollars are expenses to not show so high com in comparison to his limit or so. But that just kind of uh, represents that scenario there. All right, talking about how to how to build your credit, and in, in some people's cases, if they've uh, had things happen, adverse things that happen, maybe they lost a job or something, and they they couldn't afford their payments, and their credit score went down, then how do you go about rebuilding that credit? 
So in building credit, just the first step would be, you know, going over your reviewing your goals, also thinking about what life, uh, big life events do I have coming up? Are there, are there major purchases I'm going to be making where I might need credit? Financial stability. So building credit and, and, and strong credit score shows the, the financial stability and character uh, to, the, to the lending institution. So in building credit, here's some of these things that I'll mention are, are tools in terms of how do you build and then maintain a favorable or, or a great credit score. So credit cards would be, would be one of them. And those are revolving types of credit, as I mentioned earlier. A secured credit card. So, you know, the one thing is, is that when you're, when you turn 18 or you're older than that, and you're applying for credit in your own name for the first time, because you have no credit history, it can be a little bit tougher to, uh, to secure credit on your own for the first time. So one strategy that what people will do if they, let's just say that you don't have a, a co-signer, a parent or a family member, or, or somebody that uh, you live with who, who might be able to, to co-sign on a, on a uh, loan application with you then a secured credit card would be an example would be you typically the minimum is about $300. So the, the companies that offer secured credit cards, you might be able to put up some sort of collateral. So in my example, I'll say $300 cash of your own money. You give that to the, to the creditor and they put that money on hold basically. And they issue you a credit card with that, the, a, a limit of the same amount of money that you already put down. And so in this case, it'd be $300. And let's, so you use that card on a monthly basis. Let's say you use it for gas or other recurring expenses that you have budgeted for, and, and you pay that back and pay it off and pay it, pay it on time. That's going to be reporting on your credit file. And then usually after a year, year and a half of that type of uh, behavior where you've handled it very well, <clears throat> that the very same company or, or lender, I should say, will, will consider turning your, your, credit card into an unsecured credit card, meaning they're going to give you your $300 back. And now in, the, in many cases, they'll raise your credit line uh, to maybe a thousand or $1,500 or something. And, and then that, that same card will no longer be secured. It'll be unsecured because you've gotten your initial uh, investment of the $300 back. The secured loan will be something similar. So <clears throat> let's just say, you know, you had $3,000 that you wanted to maybe or $5,000 you wanted to put towards a used car, maybe you could even pay cash for that used car. Well, you what you could do is you, but you don't have any credit at this point, you could take that $5,000, take it to a bank or credit union, um, open up a secured loan, and then they, that money you're putting down is, is held and you're, you're paying that back over whatever term that you choose that might be 36 months, but uh, or, or 48 months, which is four years. And, and that's going to be reporting to the credit bureaus every single month that you're making an on-time payment. So you're kind of using your own money, turning it into a loan. And that loan is now uh, providing you a tool to, to build your credit. Retail or, or gas credit. So if you think about a, a gas credit card or, or uh, you know, a, a store credit card, like a Macy's or an express card or something like that, oftentimes those can be a little bit easier to get um, so it gets a credit card in your hand earlier, but one of the things you need to be wary about or, or, or look for is typically those can be a little bit higher interest uh, or higher interest rates on those. So I know that they like to, some of the store cards try to entice you with, uh, you know, discounts or you get discounts off of purchases of a certain amount, maybe it's 20% or whatever the case may be to get you to use that card. And then, um, if you, if you pay that off every month and you don't revolve a balance then that higher interest rate, isn't really going to impact you negatively. But if you revolve a balance, let's just say you, you, you buy, you go on a shopping spree and, and your favorite store and you rack up $1,500 in, in balances, well, you might be paying 26.99% interest on that, which is, which is high. Um, so you want to be wary of using those types of cards and revolving balances. But when you use properly um, or used, you know, in, in a manner that's responsible, you can certainly use that as a tool that, to help you build your credit. Getting a co-signer. So that may be possible for you. Not, it's not possible for everyone. For those that, that maybe it's not a possibility, that's when you, that they might look for a secured card or, or a secured loan. Um, maybe you have the, the ability to have a parent or a family member co-sign on a loan with you. And, and if you do that, it can work out well for you. However, you, you want to understand the level of responsibility that comes along with that. So let's just give an example that, you know, one of you applied for an auto loan because you don't have credit in your own name with your, your parent on it. And, 
you move, you're out of state because uh, you're going to school and your parents expecting that you're paying that bill on time. Well, let's just say you slip up and you miss a couple of months worth of payments or you're late. That's going to impact your uh, your parents' credit score. Just they're just as much responsible for that loan as what you would be. So you want to make sure that you're, uh, you're you're again taking that taking the responsibility with that, taking that very seriously, and uh, uh, managing it as well as you you know you would you would manage something of your own. Or to be, you know, added as an authorized user. Maybe again, as a if you're if you're away at school and, and your your parent maybe adds you as an authorized user, so you have a card in case for emergencies. Again, that can be reporting on your your credit file in a, in a favorable manner. Next, we'll talk and touch on some tips that uh, tips for using credit wisely. So really, you know, having, I mean, even when you get your first credit card, I mean, it, it, it makes sense to build your savings or build your rainy day fund of, you know, at least starting with a, with a couple a couple thousand or a few thousand dollars, something where if, if something comes up, again, your, your car breaks down or, or you have an unexpected unexpe expense at school or whatever that may be. I mean, life happens basically that you've got something where you can use cash and you don't have to put um, a, a large purchase on, uh, on a credit card, I saw. A st I don't remember the exact stat, but it just—it's—it's it's amazing to me the percentage of Americans out there that don't um, have enough in savings to kind of to, you know, withstand any some type of a life event or emergency that comes up to where they have to put something on a credit card. So, if you get in that habit of saving early and often, and and you've got a little bit of a, a cushion for yourself, or as I mentioned, a, a rainy day fund that's going to really help you, in, you know, in the long run. So when you when you Let's just say you, you don't really think you, you need a credit card, but um, you're going to get one as a tool and use it as a tool to build up your credit or build up your credit score. Many of you already have a budget. We've talked about budgeting on, on previous workshops where, you know, you've got X amount of dollars that you're bringing in and, and versus the expenses that are going out. So if the money that you already have budgeted, let's say you've got a phone bill that's a $100 or $150 and you're paying that in cash every month anyway, you might want to consider putting that char that recurring charge on your credit card and then paying that off every month. Well, now it's showing that you're using your credit card and you're paying it off with the cash that you'd normally be paying with it anyway. And that that's a way to not revolve a balance, have your percent utilization low, and, and again, using a, a credit card as a tool to build up your score. I already mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the, the general rule of thumb, and I said 30% versus just saying 33% or one third, but of your total amount of combined revolving credit, so of credit cards that you have, you wanna have your balances no greater than, than maybe a third of that. Um, or at least that's what you're going to try to, to shoot for. I mean, again, it's it's ideal if you're able to pay off what you owe every month. If you use your credit card, pay that off so you're not subjected to any type of finance charges or interest charges. Um, but if you do have to revolve a balance, because again, there's an emergency that pops up that you weren't expecting, and you don't have enough in savings for it, then uh, hopefully you can you can carry balances that are a third or less of, of versus your overall credit limits talked about this, paying your entire balance to avoid finance charges on a monthly basis. And then checking your report and score regularly. So we, we showed the credit karma and the annualcreditreport.com, just getting in the habit of, uh, I mean, at least once a year, if not, you know, some people do it as much as often as once a quarter, just to kind of, especially if you're anticipating, again, that you're going to be making a large purchase or applying for credit, that you're, you're checking your score, you're positioning yourself best for the lowest interest rate or the cheapest money to borrow, I guess you could say is another way to put it from the bank or credit union. <laughs> And then the last, one of the last things we'll talk about here will be common credit myths. So myth number one, closing a credit card will hurt my score. Not necessarily, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a little greater detail. So if you look at this example here, we've got Sarah and we've got Katie. So Sarah has three maxed out credit cards or three credit cards that she's got, you know, she's used all available funds. So she paid off one of the cards and she decides to close it to, to, you know, because she doesn't trust herself to, to not use it. She's trying to remove the temptation. So she's got two remaining cards that are maxed out. So that's, that's showing up as a hundred percent utilization. And we talked about this a couple of times and what that can do, how that can adversely affect your score versus Katie. Katie's got five open accounts of, of her accounts. All of her balances are zero or close to zero. So she's got utilization of zero. She decides to close one of her new accounts because it's got an annual fee. Maybe let's just say it's $95 every year that that hits and she, she doesn't want that fee anymore. So she 
closes that account, <laughs> she's got four remaining accounts left, all with zero balances. Her percent utilization is still zero, so her score is still remaining high. So it, it, it the answer is it, it depends. So in the in the situation with Katie, she's closing out an, <laughs> an account and it's not it's not affecting her adversely. Whereas with Sarah, it actually is. She thinks she's doing the right thing to remove temptation, but in reality, she's making her, her percent utilization still showing is maxed out and that's not helping her score, doing her score any favors. Myth number two, so checking my credit score will hurt my credit score. <clears throat> not, not exactly, and I'll get into that here. So applying too often, so when I talked about inquiries or the fact that new credit can, uh, you know, affects your score on the, on the weighting scale by about 10%, um, doing that too often can hurt it, whereas checking it, you know, a couple times a year, a few times a year is considered a soft inquiry, and that's not necessarily going to hurt your score. So um, you, you want to try to not <clears throat> apply for things too often in a short period of time. This gives you my contact information, <laughs> my name, my phone number, my email address. I would invite you at any any given time. I mean, we, that's one of the things we pride ourselves with at our credit union is, is trying to be uh, giving back, having outreach. Uh, the organizations that we partner with, we give you know free advice. If you even if you, if, if you were trying to build up your credit or you had more questions that you wanted clarification on, you know, don't hesitate to call me. Also, or email me, and, and and also we've got due to our partnership with with your great school. I mean, we we offer a hundred dollars for for any students that decide that they that they do want to um, open a relationship with One AZ Credit Union, and, and we'd give you a hundred dollar credit to do that. So just keep that in mind. All right, Renee, that's the end of my my presentation. All right, great. So we have quite a few awesome questions on the table. So at this time, do you want to do our uh, scenario poll questions as an activity or do you want to just dive into those questions? Let's just do the scenarios and then uh, we'll, we'll get right to the questions after that before we before we close out. Easy enough. All right, I'm going to stop your sharing so that I can share those scenario questions. Give me a second here to get that queued up. All right. Jason, do you want to talk it through? I sure do. To them? Okay. So th this is a link that will be provided to you. It may already be in the chat, but uh, about it's, uh, it's an exercise or an activity. You can try this yourself afterwards. I just took a couple of examples from it where, where you're thinking of yourself as you're the bank or the lending institution. And what type of loan that you're giving a customer would be most profitable for you as the bank. And, and the key learning there would be, you know, things that you'd want to think about as the consumer as you apply for loans in the future. So for this first example, they're saying to me, the Jerry, who's the lender at the bank saying, hi there, Jason Carrick, I need $2,000 for a new washer and dryer. I don't even like laundry. And now I have to spend all this money on it. So the loan options are, uh, an 18 month loan with $116 payment at a 5.9% interest rate. So you can see the three options there. Basically, what I want you to do is, is on the poll, you're gonna, you're gonna choose the option that you think would be the most profitable loan for that bank that's doing the, that's doing the lending. All right, so everyone should see the poll. Um, and so what we want you to do is pick which option you think uh, you would be paying the most interest over the life of the loan. We'll give everyone 30 seconds here. So we've got about 10 seconds remaining. Give it your best guess. And then we'll see how everyone voted and get the right answer out of Jason. So five, four, three, two, one. Let's end that polling and here are the results. So majority of folks voted that that middle option is where they would be paying most interest. Are they correct? They are correct, yes. Let me tell you, Pima, <laughs> Pima students are smart students, so I'm not surprised they got that correct. Yes. All right, so uh, let's do another scenario here. Let me... 
Show the next slide. So, all right, set them up while I set up the new poll. Okay. All right. So, this one says, hi, Jason Carrick. We're going to finally put in that pool and make our backyard something dreamy. We need to borrow $18,000. So for that $18,000 loan, which one of those options <clears throat> is going to be the most profitable for that, that bank that's lending out the money? All right. Again, 30 seconds. Give it your best guess. Jason, I don't know if that guy really looks like you or not. <laughs> yeah. Next time. All right, let's end this polling and see what the results were. So again, majority of the group voted the middle option is which would cost the most interest. Were they correct? They were correct. And just to clarify on this one, this one was a little bit trickier because if you look at it, I mean, the, the monthly payment's nice and affordable. The interest rate is the lowest interest rate. However, the term is almost double what the, you know, the 36 month term and, and more than double the, the, the 24 or two month term. So it doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad option for you because it's, it, it might be, it might fit into your budget, that payment. And, and it's the same reason why somebody might do a 72 month car loan versus a 48 month. It makes the payment much more affordable, but it is important for you to understand that you are paying the most amount of interest uh, on that over the life of the loan. And, and maybe you're okay with that, but it's, it's good to, to know that. And in some cases people will choose that option simply because it fits into their budget better and it doesn't necessarily make it a, a wrong uh, choice, but it, you are in fact paying more interest over, over the life of the loan in that particular scenario than, than the other two, so. All right. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do now is pivot over to some of the uh, questions that we got. We will do our best to work through the questions. There's a lot of great ones that came in through chat. While we also work on answering these questions, I'm gonna go ahead and right now for the sake of time, share um, our feedback survey in the chat box link so that while we're answering the questions, you can listen, but also work on filling out that feedback survey. Again, please remember that in order to receive your certificate of completion, we need you to fill out this survey and then we will send that certificate. Um, in about a week, it takes us time to close that and uh, also uh, account for everything. So let's go ahead and get started on those questions, Jason. Okay. Um, so one of the first questions that we received was, um, was kind of a hypothetical scenario. If you had an 800 credit score, how much interest would you most likely be paying for mortgage? Well, it depends because because mortgage uh, interest rates are, are literally fluctuating daily. Um, but I will say this, that we've reached historic lows recently in terms of what rates are. So uh, to a 30-year uh, mortgage, which is the most common term for, for a home loan or a mortgage, uh, it was was under 3%. And in order to qualify for that, you would need to be not necessarily an 800 score, but at least uh, typically the, the top tier credit for most banks or, or credit unions would start at, at maybe a 720 or a 730. So if you're at or above that, you're going to qualify for the best possible interest rate they have to offer of, of the ranges. But um, yeah, like, like I said, just, just recently, I mean, mortgage rates for, for fixed, fixed rates have been under 3%, which is really, really good. Awesome. And then there is quite a few questions um, asking, how do you get a secured credit card? So a secured credit card, the difference between an unsecured credit card and a, and a secured credit card for, for unsecured, if, if you've uh, if you've had credit for a while and you apply for a credit card, I mean, you're gonna, they're going to look at your credit history, see what credit lines you've handled previously, and then make a decision to issue maybe a similar credit line, and maybe that's $15,000. Well, you don't have to put up any money to, to get that. And of course, you have a certain interest rate to go along with that. And, and if you use the card and pay it off, you know, I mean, you're, you're off and running with it. But if you're trying to, to build your credit, you don't have any credit, and it's tough for you to get an unsecured credit card, that's where the back to the example where I said where, you know, a, a minimum amount on a secured credit card might be $300, or let's say it's $500, where you're taking $500 of your own money, you're giving that to the to the lender, they're putting that on hold, 
and then they're issuing you a credit line at the exact amount of what you of the money that, that you put down in this case five hundred dollars and then you're able to start using that card and and then and paying it off hopefully and that's now reporting to the to the credit reports and, and when you get to a, a certain period of time where you've shown over a year year and a half that you've, you've handled it very well that's when that, that company might give you your money back, your initial amount of money back. And, and now it's an unsecured card, which is what, I mean, really your preference would be to have all of your credit that you'd ever have to be unsecured credit where you don't actually have to put any type of money down or collateral. So hopefully that, that you know, sheds a little bit more light on it. And if, if not, you know, feel free to chat another question. Great. Now, since a lot of these are Pima students or related to Pima, there is questions about how student loan payments um, affect one's credit score. Well, I mean, if they're out of deferment, then uh, I mean, it, it's going to be back to that mix of credits. So you might have revolving credit and it'll show up as a form of installment credit. But I, I can tell you this, that the waiting on what can happen to your score, if you were to miss a payment or two on student loans can, can drastically impact your score. So uh, I can't speak as much to, to what it'll ha what it'll do positively for your score other than just a regular another on time payment. But if you do happen to when you're out of your deferment period, and if you did happen to miss a score or miss a payment, I should say, it can drastically impact your score. So it would be best to reach out to the lender, especially if you had some sort of a um, life event that came up or, or lost a job or, or you didn't have the ability to pay right now, sometimes they'll work with you on that. It'd be best to, to reach out to that, to that lender and, and talk through it to see what your options may be versus just not paying it. Cause that can really uh, dig a hole for yourself in terms of your credit score. Great. Another question was uh, if you are an authorized user for someone's good credit, will those credit benefits be taken off once you're removed as the authorized user? Well, it'll show that, you know, the, the beginning of that time frame that you started to use that credit. So it helps you from, it, when we go back to that pie graph that we talked about in, in terms of the length of your credit history, so it would help it from that standpoint, but it, it wouldn't help you going forward in terms of a regular, uh, you know, on time, it, 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 would, it would show up as in kind of your past history and not in your, your current credit that you're handling necessarily. So um, just consider that. Okay. Um, there was a question about a specific website, SavvyMoney.com, and they were wondering if that specific site uses all three credit reporting agencies. SavvyMoney.com. I'm not familiar with that one, but that's something that I'll jot down and, and check that out um, after the fact to see. SavvyMoney.com. Thank you for that. Yeah. There's another question about rental histories. Um, how do you add that to your credit report? How does it impact the credit report? Things along those lines. So it actually won't be added to your credit report just as, I think I, think I saw a question earlier where somebody asked about a bank account and if that shows, uh, you know, if, that, if that'll impact your credit score. So uh, rental will, will not, but <clears throat> your, your credit history can be used either for you or against you, I guess you could say, when you apply for rent, you can see, you know, what, what is your credit report show? Do you, what's your score? Do you have credit yet? And if so, have you missed payments? And it might not be even just missed payments on previous times that you've rented. It'd be more so if you, if you, if your score is low, it's, it's maybe in the five hundreds and um, that would represent a risk to that landlord. And, and they might decide not to allow you to rent from them because of the score, but um, previous positive rent history isn't something that's going to actually show up on your on your credit report. Just as I mean, you might have a bank account right now, whether you have one on your own or with your with your parents, and um, positively handling that isn't necessarily going to show up on your credit report. However, if if you if something were to go wrong and you and you charge that that account off and you owe that bank money, then that could adversely that, that could show up on your credit report as a charge off, and 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 certainly on. Uh, uh, we call it check systems. When you go to a bank and you try to op open an account with them, they'll typically run check systems and it'll show, you know, have you ever owed money to another bank or, have you, you know, how have you handled your, other, your past bank accounts? There was another question um, where it was asking if phone services build credit. Do phone services build credit? I so I'd assume like if you have a phone plan or a phone bill, is that one way to build credit? Not positively, but again, it could hurt you. It can adversely affect your score. If you have, 
you know, some of these phone plans, especially with iPhones, where it, you're, you're quote unquote leasing the phone. And if you break that early and it's something where you owe them money still, then they might report that to the credit report as, as a charge off or as money owed. So in that case, it would, it would make your score drop and it would be a, a, something that's uh, adversely affecting your score, but paying your, your phone bill, uh, on a monthly basis is not something that's going to show up there um, positively to positively affect your score. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. There was also just a question of what's considered a great FICO score for buying a home. Is there a target that they should be aiming to achieve? Yeah, I mean, I consider great to be um, what most banks top tier like you'll see a range like 720 and above you know you're going to qualify for the for the best interest rate and maybe uh 680 to 719 is the next tier down and then so the the this the uh interest rate might be a little bit higher and then and kind of on down on a scale so i mean above 720 certainly but if you i mean you get into the range where you're 740 750 i mean that's that's excellent 850 is the maximum score you can have and as long as uh, the time that i've been doing this i mean i have seen a few 850 scores but it's very very rare i mean it's kind of like a unicorn so even when you get somebody up over 800 i mean you, it's very rare to see that but something in the mid 700s i mean that's that's excellent okay and uh, last question, can they reopen or restart a debt when you dispute it? Can they, re yeah, I mean, some people advise that, uh, you know, let's say you had a, a medical bill that they would charge off five years ago and we saw that, you know, adverse information can stay in your credit report for up to seven years in many cases in a chapter seven bankruptcy you can stay up for 10 years. So. I mean, some people advise that it's that it's, uh, you know, in every situation is unique, but that to not pay on it at that point, because it's going to kind of restart the clock, and it's going to be an additional period of time that that's going to stay on your on your credit file. So that, that'd be something you would definitely want to consider, maybe, maybe, you know, ask for some advice for somebody that, that's worked, uh, worked in lending before, uh, or some type of credit counseling service to see, but I mean, there is an argument that people make out there that if, you know, something's very old and it's on there that, that if you were to pay it, cause they they'll oftentimes sell that off to a collection agency and that, so that the original place that you owed the money to, um, no longer even has that debt. They've sold it off to a collection agency that now tries to collect, for maybe 20 cents on the dollar or something. And, and so there'll be kind of bulldogs and they'll keep falling up and trying to do that. And if, uh, you know, if they do get any money out of you, then it could be, you know, extending the amount of time that that stays on your, on your credit report. Right. Well, I know we weren't able to get to all of the questions that were asked uh, today, but what I encourage you to do, uh, again, Jason shared his email a little bit earlier, um, and I added that in chat. Jason, if you don't mind typing that in chat once more. Sure. I also added hyperlinks to all of our different contact pages. So if your specific question wasn't answered, or if maybe another question came to your mind, please feel free to reach out to Jason or One Easy Credit Union, and they will be happy to help you out. Um, and they can, you can also go to that landing page um, to get some specific information about our partnership with One AZ Credit Union, specifically for Pima students. Again, I want to remind you that to get your certificate of completion, please fill out that feedback survey. When we send you the email after today's event, uh, we'll include that link again as one last reminder, as well as opportunities to register for our last event this semester. Um, that link was also shared in chat, but on April 8th at 5 p.m., we will be talking about cybersecurity and identity theft. So if you have not already signed up for that topic, please make sure that you do so. And then again, um, this is our contact information, all of which uh, the links were shared in chat. And please make sure that if you haven't done so already, visit um, our landing page with One AZ Credit Union. Jason, do you want to explain a little bit more detail about this? Yes. So if you click that, does it does yours go into that page or no? I, no, it doesn't. Um, so basically, there's as as Pima Community College students, because of the relationship that uh, that One Easy Credit Union has with you all, um, you know, as you're trying to establish your first banking relationship, or maybe you already have one, um, you get a hundred dollars basically when when opening your account with us. We'll give a hundred dollar credit uh, in, into your account, so it's 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 good. And and you know, I've worked for for 
most of my career, I've worked for traditional banks. This is the first credit union I've, I've worked with. And it's, it's really a breath of fresh air in the sense that we're community minded. We're, uh, we're all about service, putting, we call them members, not customers. We put our members first and, and, and look to, to, to help build relationships and, and to see people like yourselves, maybe who are trying to build and establish great uh, uh, financial history and, and, and get off to a great foot. I mean, we, we, take pride and fulfillment in, in helping, you know, people like yourselves to do that. So again, don't, don't hesitate to call. We, we have these type of consultations with people all the time and that's what we're here for. All right. Thank you, Jason. And again, thank you everyone for attending today. We are so happy that when you join us and we hope to see you again at another uh, future FYE event. And again, uh, pay attention for that email to come and also keep an eye out on our YouTube page for the recording so you can rewatch, relearn, and also share it with those you know. So take care, have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you again. Keep striving. Bye-bye.